Good morning or afternoon. My name is Tracy Cook and I am with SACS Healthcare Communications. Before I introduce our moderator and speakers on behalf of Stryker and SACS Communications, we want to thank all of our frontline workers in our audience for your commitment and passion in helping all of us through this very difficult time. We are truly indebted to all of you. Before I introduce our moderator, Kathleen Volman, and our speakers, Nicole Kupchak and Bridget Joseph, I'd like to show our audience how to send questions and comments. Our moderator for today is Kathleen Volman. Kathleen is a critical care clinical nurse specialist, educator, and consultant. She has published and lectured nationally and internationally on a variety of pulmonary critical care, prevention of health care, acquired injuries, work cultures, and sepsis recognition and management. Ms. Volman was appointed to serve as an honorary ambassador to the World Federation of Critical Care Nurses. Kathleen, welcome. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you so much, Tracy, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is Challenges in Delivering High Performance CPR, the Role of Mechanical CPR. And today speaking on this very timely topic are two outstanding speakers, Nicole Kupchak and Bridget Joseph. Nicole has practiced as a critical care nurse for over 20 years. About 15 years ago, she began working at Harborview Medical Center, a change that spurred an interest in resuscitation. Shortly thereafter, Nicole was part of a multidisciplinary team that was one of the first in the United States to implement therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest, which is awesome. As part of this effort, Nicole was responsible for protocol development and has published numerous papers on this topic. In 2013, Nicole founded Nicole Kupchak Consulting and Education. Our second speaker is Dr. Bridget Joseph. Dr. Joseph is a certified clinical nurse specialist and resuscitation committee nurse specialist. Additionally, she's worked in a variety of fields and specialties as a legal nurse consultant, a simulation education specialist, an interprofessional education consultant, as well as conducting clinical research with a focus on resuscitation. So our speakers have some disclosures. Nicole Kupchak is on the Speakers Bureau for Stryker Medical and Baxter Healthcare and a consultant for Baxter Healthcare. And Bridget jo Joseph is, uh, disclosure is Stryker Medical. This education activity is approved for one contact hour. A link to be able to obtain those CEs will be available at the conclusion of the webinar. And you have your accreditation statements here. Support for this educational activity is provided by Stryker. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Nicole. All right, well, good morning, good afternoon, good whatever it is, wherever you are. I'm really excited to chat with you about challenges in delivering high-performance CPR. We know that CPR is the absolute one thing that makes a difference in resuscitation. And unfortunately, it's really hard to do whether you work EMS or uh, work in a hospital. And so we're gonna talk about the role of mechanical CPR in uh, providing uh, chest compressions and assisting in resuscitations. So we're gonna talk about the challenges to providing high performance and high quality CPR. I'm gonna chat about the data to support the use of mechanical CPR devices. And then I'm gonna talk about how to use uh, mechanical CPR to minimize exposure during resuscitation events, which is timely given the pandemic we're going through. And then Dr. Bridget Joseph is gonna join us to chat about her latest project in implementing mechanical CPR for support to staff as well. So what does high performance CPR look like? So Bridge is on the line with me and we're just gonna kind of ping pong a little bit back and forth. So we, I've already said, we know chest compressions have got to be spot on. You wanna be on the chest, for as much of the arrest as possible. And that's what we uh, refer to as a chest compression fraction. You wanna make sure you defibrillate early and minimize any pauses and you don't wanna overventilate. So Bridget, what else makes a difference in resuscitation? I'd say one of the big things is communication, clear communication between team members. Yeah, that's huge. And, uh, and, and the environment. So to be able to, to communicate, you need things quiet, no yelling, no shouting. 
Yeah, and some of you who work in EMS might be like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, some of that's out of their control, right? Um, but in hospitals, noise is an absolute, it's a, it's a huge issue. But basically, we've got to have an environment that lends to the delivery of high-performance CPR, and it can just be really challenging. So according to AHA, what matters? So Bridget, like if you were to say, hey, here are the AHA guidelines or the ILCOR, the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation Guidelines, what are like the absolute things that you stress to staff? Oh, early compressions, hands on and at a rate 100 to 120 and get in those two inches, two to two and a half inches as soon as you can. Yeah, and absolutely. We, yeah. Always. And yeah. shock and then, as quickly as possible. <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the things that's happened is we've gotten really good at shocking and then getting back on the chest. But what we're finding, and Bridget um, can speak to this, but we're pulling data out of defibrillators. We're analyzing that data. And what we're finding is that a lot of facilities have these big, long pause times before they defibrillate. Have you kind of, have you seen that, Bridget? Oh, Yeah all the time and it's it's something that staff don't even recognize people don't realize that they are that they are having that hands off time they just they lose their focus on doing their compressions and then there's this long shock time and they don't recognize it because of the timing and the adrenaline rush but it impacts patient care Absolutely. Yeah. And then I think some other things, it's just really, you know, if there's any respiratory therapist or anyone who manages the airway listening to this, just please do not overventilate. And I've done webinars where I've actually had you pull, hold up two fingers and a th opposable thumb to pretend like you're bagging. And it is much slower than you think it is. You should absolutely be using capnography to verify tube placement. In many situations, it can capnography can be a really good tool to use to guide CPR quality. And then medications, I'll, you know, I'll be super honest, the evidence to support medications um, is somewhat mixed. Really what I, I think the bottom line is you, you've got to get on the chest and stay on the chest. That is absolutely what matters as well as defibrillation. And um, I love this. So back in 2013, there was a, a CPR or consensus group that made this statement, poor quality CPR should be considered a preventable harm, which, and if you think about the impact of that statement, that's pretty huge, right? And then in um, 2014, a study was published that saying in, in a large, very, a huge analysis, over 9,000 out of hospital cardiac arrest patients, only 45% of those patients received the recommended depth of compressions. So we know delivering the appropriate depth with manual CPR is super challenging. And then that great group from um, the same CPR consensus group uh, came back in 2018 and said poor quality CPR is a preventable harm. And I, I think we should all like let that sink in and then ask, how are we doing clinically at the bedside? Are we providing the best CPR that we can? So there have been, we know there are tons of issues with manual CPR. So Bridget, what have you come across as issues with manual CPR? I think some of the biggest um, the biggest issues are uh, not recoiling, not going fast enough, or uh, just hammering down on the chest and going too fast. So yeah, you're not going into the <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's my favorite? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and then you know not not ventilating appropriately while you're doing manual CPR. Um, and one of the big things that I see a lot is that you know, people don't recognize when they're fatigued and you can yes. see when you're watching end tidal CO2, but people don't feel it. And they like are, it's a challenge to themselves. I got to do this two minutes. You don't have to do the two minutes. If you're fatigued, yeah. it's not helping the patient switch. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, kind of, I'm just imagining some of the people we've worked with, like just being, I'm too tired. Please do. I mean, you know, it's, it's a tough thing to admit, right? It's super it tough. Is. It's an ego blow, but you got to oh, do it. <laughs> totally. Cause I'm like, I am, I don't, I might be short in stature, but I am scrappy. Right. But I, I'll be honest, like I've measured myself and after about a minute, my quality starts to decrease in chest compressions. And I think another thing that if you've ever given compressions on any type of a mattress, be it a stretcher for training, transport, an ED stretcher, or a hospital bed, there is swing in that mattress. Unless you're providing mm -hmm. chest compressions on a solid floor, it, you're going to get swing. And um, what I did was um, 
I actually recorded this video myself, but what I want you to, this is uh, David Bean, who's awesome, uh, but what you can see is, um, this was at NTI a, a, about a year and a half ago, is when he compresses on a backboard, on, and this was a stretcher, this wasn't even a hospital bed, you can see that there's significant swing um, in the mattress, and you have to overcome all of that to adequately compress. And so there's really good data to demonstrate that compressible surfaces lead to shallow chest compressions. And if you're using an accelerometer-based feedback device, those often overestimate the chest compression depth. So if you're purchasing devices, you really do need to know what technology it uses to estimate the chest compression depth. And this is um, from a hospital I had worked with um, for a couple of years. We had done a quality improvement project, and they were using um, a device that um, did not use accelerometer technology. It used a different type of method to measure the chest compression depth. And what you can see here is that um, they this was from a real code, a real patient who was having cardiac arrest. They were compressing at a rate of about 141. And the little blue dots here indicate the depth of the chest compression. They're only hitting about a half inch depth. So I'm going to throw up some purple lines to indicate where those blue dots should have been. It should have been way down here. This is the two inch mark. And they weren't even coming anywhere near two inches. They were only hitting about a half inch depth when they were compressing at a rate of 141. And that's one of the things you have to remember is if you are starting to go over 110, 120, depth is going to be compromised oftentimes in your chest compression quality. And then the same uh a hospital I was working with, they started using a metronome and, and using a device that measured depth. And using the metronome, they were able to get their rates under control really nicely. So all of these rates you can see are under 120. But the really challenging thing is they still, even though they slowed down their rates, weren't able to hit depth. And a lot of the providers from, I know specifically this code, were tall statured males. And I think this just speaks to what a massive problem that mattress swing is, be it on a stretcher or a hospital bed. It is a, it's a real issue. So unless you're compressing on a, a, a solid surface like the floor, it's you have to over, overcome all of that swing. So Bridget, when do you feel CPR is challenging? I know for myself, I've been in really prolonged codes and just find that everyone gets tired and um, and we our CPR quality suffers. What are some situations you can think of where CPR is super challenging? Um, you know, yeah, prolonged codes are already ha always hard. And then I think also if you're, you know, on a stretcher, if you're somewhere yes. random, like transporting a patient, you're in the middle of the hallway, they go into a rest. Um, that's one of the times that I see that people have that fight or flight. Do I start compressions or do I move the patient? How do I call for help? Yeah. Um, which I know EMS staff, you know, that happens all the time, uh, you know, but in the back of an ambulance, that's not an easy place to be doing, you know, adequate CPR and, and getting in those, those compressions as you're going over bumps, going around turns. Um, and with it's limited not safe staff. Either. I mean, there's, there, there's no way it's yeah. safe for the EMS provider. Oh, not at all. Not at yeah. All. Yeah. And I think the cath lab is another area where safety really comes into cons consideration and question. You know, when you're <laughs> irradiating, uh, <laughs> using radiation <laughs> to uh, view the coronary arteries, you cannot keep someone safe in, in a cath lab. And not only that, but the table is, the ta usually the cath tables are very high and um, they're not designed to withstand all of that ex exerted pressure from chest compressions. So one of the questions we're asking, especially in certain situations, should we rethink the way we provide chest compressions? And I'll be super honest, like I, I really do. So we're going to ask a polling question now. So Tracy's going to launch the poll. And what I want to know is in your EMS agency or your hospital where you are working, are you using mechanical CPR devices? So um, just click on the screen. So either it's a yes, a yes, but not consistently. You have a device, but rarely use it. Or no, you're not using mechanical CPR. So I just want to kind of get a feel of um, who's in the audience and what your experience is with mechanical CPR. All right, Tracy, do we have the votes rolling in? They are coming in right now. Okay, cool. I can't wait to see what everyone's saying out there. 
I know we've got a lot of people with us today. And it's Let's cool give her to get everyone's background. Yeah, I didn't specifically ask where they worked, but I think this will give us an idea of, of uh, you know, their experience with mechanical CPR devices. Okay. All right, Tracy, what's it looking like? And there oh, you go. Look at this. Okay, there we go. So 53% of you aren't. Um, let's see, the next common, the most uh, uh, popular answer was yes, but not consistently. And then 19% of you said yes, and then 9% said we have a device, but you rarely use it. Okay, awesome. So we're going to keep moving along. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by looking at the four randomized control trials that were published evaluating mechanical CPR. So randomized control trials are one of the highest levels of evidence. Um, the way I've divided this chart, and this is so funny, this chart took me about a couple hours to make up. I was like, I had all these slides and I'm like, no, let's just put it in one place in a chart. So um, the first two studies are called the Lincoln Paramedic Trials, and these specifically evaluated the piston device that most um, mirrors manual CPR. And then the CERC trial and then Halstrom et al., which were um, actually based out of Seattle, had evaluated the load-bearing uh, type devices. Those are the devices that kind of wrap around the patient's chest and use both the thoracic and um, cardiac uh, system to assist with chest compressions. I'm going to be super honest. So here's my disclosure. I've only ever used the piston device, aka the Lucas. I've only ever used that. So that's really in clinical experience. That's all I can truly speak to from an experience perspective, but you can see the numbers of patients enrolled in these studies are pretty massive, and these are very difficult studies to take on. But um, the LINK trial basically was an efficacy study, just you know, can we do this? And it asked the question, is mechanical CPR superior to manual CPR? And then the paramedic trial, you could see enrolled over 4,000 patients, same thing. It was an effectiveness and superiority trial, which was a multi-center randomized control trial. These were all, all of the studies so far um, in these big four large RCTs were conducted in out of hospital EMS. And then in a little bit, I'm going to go over the hospital studies that have been done, which I'm going to say are really, really limited. So interestingly enough, um, so the link was done in Europe and paramedic in the UK, again, using the piston types um, devices. Uh, link evaluated four hour survival and found that the results were about the same paramedic evaluated 30 days survival and again found that the results were the same. So there was no statistical differences whether you got mechanical CPR or whether you got manual CPR. Um, so interestingly enough, there was a trend to better outcomes um, in the LINK trial if mechanical CPR, um, so it was a LINK, I'm sorry, a trend to better neuro outcomes uh, if you got mechanical CPR. And then um, in the paramedic trial, the results were the same. Now, if you look at the load-bearing device trials, which were Circ and Halstrom, um, you know, it, it was the results were not as favorable for mechanical. Um, so you could see in the Halstrom study, um, and we were actually part of that study and it had um, stopped early just because we were seeing such poor results, but um, the mechanical group did not do as well and, um, and Circ was actually terminated early. So, I'm going to, again, I'm going to focus mostly on the piston because uh, type devices because that's what I have experience with. So why are we seeing these neutral studies? So it wasn't a negative trial, meaning like it showed harm, but we didn't see this big advantage using mechanical CPR devices. So why would that be? So why isn't the evidence overly supportive? And I, the, the answer is there's a lot of limitations to doing big studies like this. So first of all, you're going to have two groups. You're going to have one group that gets manual CPR and one group that gets manual CPR and then you add mechanical CPR. So there's there's no way to really do a randomized control trial where you get nothing but mechanical CPR. So regardless, each group is going to have to get some component of manual CPR. Now, there's time bias that gets introduced into that. So when did you put the mechanical CPR device on? Because if you place the mechanical CPR device on the patient, 10 plus minutes into the code, 
really, can you get an answer to whether mechanical CPR is advantageous? And so time bias is always going to be a challenge that we're going to face with. I honestly doubt we'll ever see an overly positive trial because of these natural these biases that are introduced into the studies. There's also natural bias introduced into studies because there's no way to blind the treatment group, right? There's no way to blind the fact that I'm putting a mechanical CPR device on a patient, or there's no way to blind that you're only getting manual CPR. So there's always going to be some sort of bias introduced. It is, in a lot of these studies, it's unclear of the CPR quality prior to mechanical CPR device application. So maybe the patient got, you know, five minutes of terrible manual CPR and or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, and then we put this mechanical device on. Again, anything that's done late in the game and late in resuscitation, we know time is everything. You know, I, there's not a definition of what late would be, but let's be honest. I mean, I think f five minutes is really late, you know, if you're trying to evaluate the effectiveness um, of a, a technology. And um, the other thing that is really challenging is, uh, you know, that adds again another bias is that when you're in, in one of the studies, the manual CPR group, they measured the CPR quality that was being given. The provider knew that their CPR quality was being measured. So when are you going to perform better? When you know somebody's watching you or, you know, if you're not being watched and monitored? You know, and so, and so again, these are all just natural biases that are introduced into these studies. And then I, I think one of the things, and, and something I'm going to stress today is if you're going to use mechanical CPR, you have absolutely got to do really good training, but not only initial training, you have got to do on ongoing training with your teams and you've got to practice placement and um, you know one of the studies one of the big studies they did training on the device prior to the study and then only did it yearly so again it's just it's really tough if you're not doing this on a consistent basis so then in 2017 the MECA trial was published and that was mechanical cardiopulmonary resuscitation versus standard, standard manual CPR and out of hospital cardiac arrest by emergency ambulance crew. That's a mouthful. <laughs> that's, that's a mouthful, right? Uh, but this was a randomized control trial where they evaluated mechanical CPR placed early, mechanical CPR placed late, and then uh, manual CPR. And what they found was that patients had the highest return of spontaneous circulation. If you could see um, the white bars are early placement of mechanical CPR. They use the Lucas device in the study. So if Lucas was placed early, those patients had the highest rates of return of spontaneous circulation and, and um, so quite interesting. And then um, the highest survival were in those patients who also had mechanical CPR placed early. So if you're placing it late, you can see the survival is, uh, it's it's not good. I think the key is if you're going to use mechanical CPR, use it early and don't use it as a last ditch effort and expect that you're going to get amazing results. That's just not going to happen. So what this is an example of a pre-hospital protocol from an EMS agency and the way their protocol runs is obviously patients would get bystander CPR you want to defibrillate as early as possible continue your manual CPR until your uh, BLS team gets there and then transition after one to two shocks, maybe up to three shocks, transition early to mechanical CPR and then continue shocks and treatment with mechanical CPR in the resuscitation efforts. And you would continue mechanical CPR until you got ROSC or until you decided to terminate the resuscitation efforts. And I think that's the key. Anytime you do anything, time bias is, is significant. And we're seeing that right now in the sepsis world with the vitamin C studies. You know, a lot of you have heard about, um, you know, this whole idea of giving vitamin C to patients who have sepsis. And we're finding these studies are neutral. Well, in two of the studies, they didn't give the vitamin C till day two. Of course, it's not, you're not going to get a positive trial. You've got to, you know, when you're evaluating an intervention, in most situations, the intervention needs to be done early if you're going to see a difference. So this is an example of a patient, this is a real patient who is receiving mechanical CPR and just right before, this is a kind of a CPR report card that 
these are data that are pulled from the defibrillator that were used during the resuscitation. And you can see initially uh, when the mechanical CPR device was first placed, the capnography was about 20 millimeters of mercury, so about 20, um, with the initial placement of mechanical CPR. And then very quickly, within about a minute and a half to two minutes, the patient's capnography was up over 50. And I think what's going to come in the future are more physiologic studies evaluating, you know, does a mechanical CPR device improve capnography, which was is a surrogate marker often, uh, you know, for perfusion, or does it improve maybe um, one of the big things right now is cerebral oximetry and, and maybe, or what's called NEARS technology, the near infrared spectroscopy. And maybe what we'll see in future studies is that mechanical CPR improves perfusion to the brain. Um, you know, again, these in, evaluating these types of things in humans are really difficult, not impossible, but can be super challenging. Okay, now if any of you, so it sounds like a few of you have used mechanical CPR out there, um, I will tell you this has happened to me and it's really freaky. So you've got a patient who's in VFib, you're using mechanical CPR, so you've got a mechanical CPR device in use, then the patient wakes up and starts talking to you. They open their eyes and start talking to you. Bridget, has this ever happened to you clinically? I was actually just thinking about this. I didn't realize you were going to bring this up, but I was thinking when you were talking about the increased capnography and the increased CPP, this did happen to us that we would, you know, the patient would start talking and then we would stop it and then nothing. They pass out. Yeah, yeah, and then you start it again, and then they're like, get this off me. Yeah, yeah. and if you've ever been <laughs> in a situation, it is really, really, it's very eerie, um, but it, it's, it's one of those situations where I feel like you kind of need some assistance. So what do you do? And this has been, uh, there's been a lot of talk about this in the media. So CNN did a, stu uh, a, a um, story on this. A patient was awake for 90 minutes of CPR because the mechanical CPR device was giving such good um, perfusion. And ZDog MD did a, um, a uh, kind of a story on this as well. And I know I've covered it on my YouTube show. Uh, but from Nebraska, they had published back in 2016 this, this case report of a patient who had woken up it was a 55 year old male who had woken up while they were getting mechanical CPR and they actually shared their protocol. So a lot of facilities now, especially I think, I feel like EMS is a few steps ahead of the hospital um, on this, but um, they had actually come up with a protocol where they use ketamine and midazolam for patients who do wake up, you know, if they're receiving mechanical CPR or even with manual CPR, if they wake up um, to, you know, because <laughs> the last thing you want are these patients having horrendous PTSD, right? They're there's just so much we don't know about this, but a lot of facilities are creating protocols now to address that. Now, one of the things I find that is, I think, the most beneficial is that you can actually, with the mechanical CPR devices in use, you can shock right through the mechanical CPR uh, compressions being delivered. So this is a, a strip, again, this is from a real patient who's being resuscitated, and what we had done is uh, or what not we, I wasn't involved in this case, but what had been done was they stopped the device, quickly assessed, it was V-fib, so you could see they pre-charged the device. Um, so let me just kind of back up, but uh, it was a patient who was in V-fib, they quickly stopped the mechanical CPR device, saw it was V-fib, then restarted it. So now mechanical compressions are restarted, they charged the defibrillator, 200 joules shocked right through mechanical CPR. Um, so, it, this, it, and this can be done absolutely with mechanical CPR devices. Really, you should just be pausing it very momentarily, just for a couple seconds, assess do you have a shock of verbal rhythm, yes or no, and then restart the device and shock right through chest compressions. And that's one of the major advantages of mechanical CPR. Now, here's the thing I need to mention is that you need to remember every two minutes to look and and I think that's a challenging challenging thing is you every two minutes you've got to remember to stop to look I've seen cases where they've gone six seven minutes and have forgotten to stop the device to assess uh, for a shockable rhythm so just remember to look to see if the patient's still in a shockable rhythm um, if you're using mechanical CPR now, here's what you don't want to do. So this is a patient who's getting mechanical CPR. And again, this is a real patient. They're getting mechanical CPR. The device was stopped. Clearly, we've got a shockable rhythm. We've got a shockable rhythm. So this is 
238 and 38 seconds and you can see it's it's a, there's a very long pause uh, for over 30 seconds where they shocked and then restarted the device. You literally could have, um, I'm up here in the upper right, could have seen that it was a shock algorithm, restarted the device right away, charged your defibrillator, and then shocked right through compression. So you don't, you do not need to have these big pauses if you've got somebody you know, who's in a shockable rhythm. All right, so let's go back to manual CPR. There is def there, there's a lot published on doing manual CPR and causing injury to patients. Um, I will be honest, I have definitely broken ribs on patients by providing manual CPR. Um, rib fractures are common. Um, sternal fractures aren't as common, but can happen. Uh, luckily, pneumothoraces aren't as common, but can happen with manual CPR. And then liver, spleen, liver and spleen damage. You know, you always have to wonder if patients are experiencing liver and spleen damage, were your hands in the right place when you were providing compressions? Um, there are some ca um, case reports of myocardial visceral damage as well. So we know there are injuries with manual CPR. So the question is, are there more injuries with mechanical CPR? Is mechanical CPR safe? And um, Dr. Koster, who's uh, out of uh, Europe, had um, actually done a study randomized control trial with 337 patients asking this question. So they evaluated out of hospital patients arriving to the emergency department with ongoing CPR, um, evaluating mechanical CPR devices and um, injury versus uh, manual CPR and injuries in those group. So the control group was the manu patients who got manual CPR only, um, and in those groups they used a CPR feedback device, whereas the treatment group was the mechanical CPR. And um, in the in-hospital studies, they had CCU nurses. So when these patients came into the emergency department, with ongoing CPR, um, CCU nurses would respond with study equipment and then they were refreshed, they got refresher courses on application of mechanical CPR every six months. And what did they find? So the primary outcome they were evaluating was serious or life-threatening resuscitation-related injury to visceral organs. And basically what they found is there um, so they evaluated autopulse Lucas and manual CPR, and what you can see is, you know, in the different groups, um, the you can see there's about 103 patients in autopulse, 108 in Lucas, and then 126 in manual, and injuries. They were a little bit higher in um, auto pulse, but between Lucas and manual, you can see manual did have the lowest, but the Lucas device did not have um, statistically significant higher injuries. Um, so you can see no damage, and that's really what I want to know: like how many patients are dam or you know are free of injury? And you can see in all groups, no damage. It was about the same. So about 82 to 83 percent of patients experienced no damage with either mechanical CP. CPR or manual CPR. However, when you kind of dig in and, and just look at kind of the extent of different injuries that happen, is that you can see pneumothorax, uh, pneumothorax was highest in autopulse, six versus two versus four, and then tension pneumos, um, each of the mechanical CPR devices had um, a, a tension pneumo, and then pneuma, um, pneumomediastinum, uh, four in autopulse, and then lung contusion, um, one autopulse, one manual. So interesting, um, results. And then again, liver rupture, you have to wonder where was the device? Was the, you know, were the hands or was the device in the right place? Uh, but in general, overall study conclusions were that uh, in the manual CPR group, they weren't able to hit depth. Uh, so they were, they underperformed in the manual CPR, not able to hit the appropriate depth. Uh, the average was 1.88 inches. Uh, they also concluded Lucas did not increase the risk of injury, um, but an increased risk of injury couldn't be ruled out with the use of the load-bearing devices, and so those were the conclusions from the authors. So, you know, I think this this makes me feel a little bit better knowing, I mean, we know that we have injury with manual devices, but um, there wasn't anything that was overtly statistically significant in the, um, uh, especially the piston type devices, but in just in general. Now, what? Let's, I'm going to go to the cath lab now. So now we're going to kind of transition to more 
in hospital. And um, so Dr. Atman Shah and his group um, out of the University of Chicago have really been interested in mechanical CPR devices for use in PCI where patients are resting. And because you, I mean, a lot of us are aware a lot, you know, there are a number of cases of PEA and specifically VFib arrest where the cause of that arrest is an occluded coronary artery. And the, this study I thought was um, really interesting, but they were um, evaluating manual chest compressions versus mechanical compressions and mechanical compressions. And you can see they got ROSC or return of spontaneous circulation in about 42% of patients receiving manual compressions and in about 74% of those receiving mechanical compressions. So really interesting findings in their group. And this is a survival curve basically just showing the dotted lines are patients who got manual compressions. And those patients did not fare as well. So if everyone died or no one survived, the lines would be down here. If, oops, if everyone lived, let me go back, sorry about that. If everyone lived, the line would be way up here. And you can see the group that got mechanical CPR had much higher survival than those who got manual CPR. And then those who got manual CPR just, they died quick. And a, a lot of them probably honestly died in the cath lab because you could see how steep that drop off is in that curve. Um, so in 2016, a meta-analysis was conducted looking at all the data that's out there for in-hospital cardiac arrest and the use of mechanical CPR devices. And I'll just be super honest, the data are really poor, they're very limited. There's only been three randomized control trials and then um, eight observational trials. But um, in general, in the small data set that is there, it favors mechanical CPR, but again, the, the studies are of very poor quality. So why would the diff the results be different for the hospital? Um, because pre-hospital, the four randomized control trials I showed you, the studies were neutral. Um, so why would a meta-analysis in hospitalized patients find mechanical CPR to be favorable. And I think one of the biggest things is just earlier deployment. The patient's already in the hospital, they arrest, the teams are there, we respond pretty darn quickly, and maybe early deployment could be a reason for that. Um, there are some major challenges in providing manual CPR on a mattress. And I truly, I have actually spoken to some leaders at the American Heart Association and have shown some data on mattress CPR in depth. And maybe the issue of overcoming mattress swing is far bigger than we've ever acknowledged and really truly realized. And then, um, but again, we have to remember the evidence of the data in these meta-analysis was actually pretty poor. So, um, so a feasibility study, and I was trying to figure out where they are in conducting, but this is out of Warwick University. It's called the Compressed Randomized Control Trial, and it's a feasibility study that is specifically evaluating in-hospital cardiac arrest with mechanical CPR. So um, I'm not, I couldn't figure out where they are with this, but I know it is being actively evaluated. So stay tuned. Maybe we will have some, um, some data here in the near future. So I'm gonna wrap up my section with just asking the question, can mechanical CPR be used as a bridge? And you might be thinking to yourself, well, like a bridge to what? Um, I'm thinking you've got somebody who's in arrest and you think it's a cardiac cause, so a bridge to PCI or maybe it's a bridge to ECMO in ECLS in those that patient who's arresting. Um, so you've got a 56-year-old male who uh, had experienced an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, it was a V-fib arrest. EMS was doing compressions on and off for about 20 minutes. Um, they were able to transport the patient to the hospital. The patient's now in the emergency department, and this is one of those patients who, you know, they got ROSC, lost their pulse, got them back, lost them, had gotten four rounds of CPR, but now uh, they're pulseless. Now, at one of the points where they had return of spontaneous circulation, got a 12-lead ECG, and you know what? This isn't overly helpful because they've got a big right bundle branch block here. So this is this could be masking. It's really unclear if the patient's having a STEMI. So what should we do next? So with that, so you've got the case, 56-year-old, V-fib, get them back, lose them, get them back, lose them. Um, we're doing compressions. We end up putting mechanical CPR on um, this patient. So I'm going to launch a poll and ask what you think. What do you think the next step should be? You've got this patient who's now rearrested. 
should we call it and say, you know what, EMS tried, the ED tried, there's no hope. Should we place a mechanical device and activate the cath lab because there is hope? Or should you say, are you, or maybe are you saying, I'm glad I don't have to make this decision. So what do you think? Should we take this patient, put them on mechanical CPR and take them to the cath lab? Uh, what are your thoughts? I would love to know what your thoughts are on this patient. All right, so Tracy, what do you think? I think we need to give everyone just another few moments to answer. Okay, cool. All right, let's see what you all said. A lot of you are like, I'm glad I don't have to make this decision, but most of you are saying, let's place a mechanical CPR device, activate the cath lab, there's hope, yeah. So um, that's exactly what happened, is the, oh, we're gonna uh, go ahead and continue, but the mechanical CPR device was placed, got the patient to the cath lab. So let's look at this patient's case. Um, so this is, isn't the patient themselves. I'm actually gonna show you some uh, cats in a second, but this is what it would look like in a cath lab. Now, this is an older uh, mechanical CPR device, but um, you can see you can easily access the patient um, and, and do PCI with mechanical CPR. Um, so this is actually a film. Um, thank you, Dr. Atman Shah. He's um, cannulating the femoral. Uh, so it's getting access really quickly in the cath lab. You can see a mechanical CPR device is um, in use. Patient has a massive LAD occlusion up here. So patient's got a significant left anterior descending occlusion, which likely caused their v arrest. So Dr. Shaw, you could see mechanical CPR devices being used. Um, he's wiring the um, LAD. And this is uh, just demonstrating a post stent. Uh, he's actually wiring on the left here. And then on the right, this uh, he had placed a stent. So here we go, stent placed to the LAD. LED is completely open in this film and what's not moving anymore? The mechanical CPR device because we got return of spontaneous circulation. So once he got that left anterior descending artery open, was able to reestablish perfusion and, um, and sh successfully shock the patient out of ventricular fibrillation. So application is everything. I'm gonna show you a super quick video um, from Cypress Creek EMS, so thank you to them for um, showing us how they place the device. So they're gonna show you what we call the lift technique. Um, EMS, I think most often does this technique where they'll actually lift the patient to place the mechanical CPR device. Oftentimes they'll put the, um, the back plate under the patient's head and neck initially. And, um, and then they'll do a quick lift. And what I want you to note is how they're staying on the chest and providing compressions the entire time. So you can see pads are being placed. And then usually we'll put the board under the patient's head just to kind of get everything ready. We'll turn on the device. So the device is turned on, it's ready to go. So you can see how she placed the backboard under the patient's head. They're gonna do a quick lift and then push the back plate under the patient's back. And they're gonna line the top of the plate with the patient's basically like with their armpits. Cause you don't want this to be placed too low. That's where you can see visceral organ damage. And note how she's placing the device while he was providing compressions and their complete total off chest time was about 10 seconds. So, um, so very, very minimal time off the chest. So pretty impressive. Um, now I'm gonna show you a different technique that we use in hospital a lot of times uh, where we'll roll the patient side to side. So again, I filmed this at NTI just to kind of demonstrate how you would do the side to side roll to place a mechanical CPR device. So you would, again, roll the patient. You need a couple people to do this, but stay on the chest. You're gonna align the top of the backboard with the patient's armpits, continue CPR, and, um, and basically you're gonna 
slide the device in between the person who's doing compressions, in between their arms uh, to place. The device is already on, it's ready to go, and you can see that off chest time is very minimal. The one thing I am gonna say, and I really want to stress this, is this has to be practiced. You cannot just say, oh, here, go use this device and expect people to do this well. And Dr. Levy, um, who's a pretty amazing EMS director, him and his fabulous crew up in Anchorage, Alaska, demonstrated that they were able to decrease application time. It was a big a quality improvement initiative, and they decreased application time by doing debriefing and mock codes, and they were able to decrease their application time or that time to first mechanical depression from 21, seven, 21 seconds to seven seconds by practicing debriefing and doing mock codes with this. Now recently, kind of the big hubbub that's been recently published was from the Department of Defense for COVID-19. And so the Department of Defense actually put out a document recommending best practice would be the use of a mechanical CPR device on patients who are experiencing cardiac arrest. And um, as you all know, chest compressions are considered an aerosol generating procedure and they listed best practice as using mechanical CPR. So that was from the DOD. And, um, you know, and again, I think you can really minimize the amount of people you need for either out of hospital cardiac arrest or in hospital arrest by using mechanical CPR devices in these special situations. So, and then the American Heart Association also released a, um, updated guidelines for COVID-19 and um, also recommending that you, or just um, supporting the idea of using mechanical CPR devices, in, especially during the pandemic for patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. And I, but again, the number one um, thing is you've got to protect yourself in resuscitation. You are the number one. You have to protect yourself if you've got a patient who's got suspected or, or confirmed COVID-19 if they have a cardiac arrest. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Bridget Joseph, who's going to take us through what um, a project that she recently implemented uh, during the pandemic. Are you ready, Bridget? I am, and thank you so much, Nicole, and I'm happy to be here today to talk to you guys um, about how quickly we implemented mechanical CPR during the pandemic. Um, so I just want to kind of give you guys some background on um, on our kind of our story. So we had advocated, and by we, I really mean me, um, had advocated to have mechanical CPR uh, in our emergency department. Uh, EMS was using it. Some of the EMS departments that were coming to us were using it. Um, but our, our physician leadership really kind of stalled the imp implementation. Um, they just had all these what ifs. What if people didn't feel comfortable? What if there, maybe there was a delay? Uh, you know, what if, what if, what if? And what it came down to when, you know, we created all these policies and protocols and ways to, to train people so we could just do it, um, the concern really finally came out that there just wasn't a strong enough RCT that supported, uh, you know, the use of mechanical CPR. And, you know, as Nicole spoke about, th there's a lot of reasons that there's not a, a strong RCT that just says, do it, it's better for patient care. Um, so this was me, the man punching the computer uh, by the eight millionth stall of implementing our, our mechanical CPR. Um, but uh, I persevered, uh, <laughs> and here I am today to talk about it. But uh, but then in March, um, you know, COVID-19 hit Boston, and I do work in Boston, and uh, I'm a director for the Emergency Cardiovascular Care Center, um, but I was actually moved into the hospital incident command center. Um, so I was working to, you know, increase PPE requirements, you know, making sure that everyone had an N95 to enter rooms. We made sure that we decreased staff in the rooms because, you know, as Nicole mentioned, CPR was deemed an APG based upon, you know, all what we assumed and what we heard from Europe. And that was, you know, in the rest of the world. And so that's how we rolled at that point. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were protecting staff as well as we could because there were so many unknowns and at that time magically uh, our physicians got on board and let us deploy the uh, mechanical cpr and within minutes of getting the green light from the incident command center 
I had training started. Um, I had staff watching a training video that's about 10 minutes with a little quiz. And I had already trained a handful of staff uh, that worked all different shifts and we went through and we have made sure we changed the schedule to make sure that they were on kind of uh, at various times during the next two weeks and uh, they basically just offered hands-on sessions with the Lucas device around the clock every shift they had people come in get it on the mannequin and use it and um, and that was how we did it and it was absolutely bonkers i do roll less all the time i do new implementations and this was zero to a thousand in two seconds and i really didn't even have time to think and i never really have done anything like that before but as well we were getting the devices in from ems so we were easy to it was easier to just toss backboards you know we'd hand them ours and just put our device on and and keep on keeping on we the staff loved it because they did feel more protected from COVID and they said that they were so much less fatigued after all of the uh, after all the cardiac arrests we were getting. Um, and then the peak of the surge in, in April, so a few weeks later, uh, we did get the, the DOD statement supporting mechanical CPR and I really didn't even I didn't bother consulting the the physician groups. Um, I just went right to my rep, asked for a quote for you know a couple devices, a trainer, um, and I just <laughs> stepped out of my role a little bit and emailed the chief nursing officer, and I just requested emergency funds to support the implementation um, of mechanical CPR. And unprecedented, uh, within an hour, I had approval for all the funds and placed the order. Um, it was absolutely unreal and I did not have time to think too, too much, but I do utilize um, EMS uh, as my, uh, they're my per diem staff. They help me do run ACLS and BLS classes. Um, they're really familiar with mechanical CPR because they use it uh, throughout the city of Boston and the surrounding areas. So I called them and I was like, when are you on the trucks, when are you not? And we immediately scheduled 23 in-person uh, training events, and we had within a 10 day period, we had 126 nurses, uh, or two weeks, I guess, not 10 days, but we had 126 nurses, 30 physicians, uh, and we scheduled it at change of shift. So 6 a.m. to, you know, 9 a.m., and then 5 to 9 at night. And we just had them come in socially distance, and we went through the skills. And the EMS staff that work for me are so experience with it they were able to answer every question give them tips and tricks how to you know make sure it's in the right place um and then we had 555 staff actually uh complete the video and quiz because staff are so on board with doing this to protect themselves um the residents not so much did they attend our sessions um but when they realized that they needed to be on board with it um we did schedule some extra sessions just for them to make sure that they were comfortable with it um because they saw it coming to events and uh they weren't really sure how to how to handle that um we then my big challenge quite honestly was um getting it to events and i i had to get by in quickly because we are a large hospital two campuses with a major intersection between um a code team on each campus which you know by the minute it depends who it is because of who's carrying the pager and i had two mechanical cpr devices so we did this rapid training we put a video out with the president of the hospital and we just got everyone on board we made sure that um the icu nurses were bringing a already bringing a bag of ppe of n95s and uh you know duck bills and whatnot and an io to every code so i couldn't ask them now to bring a mechanical cpr device uh so i finally got the medical interns to agree to bring it to each event as long as the nursing staff and other staff there helped them so as this moment i got agreement from them um, we just deployed it. I gave it two more days of training and we we rolled it out. And that's not how normally we would roll, um, but we we rolled it out. And so after um, after the surge and after all was said and done, we did run a survey um, because we did have 21 in-hospital cardiac arrests uh, between April and June. Um, and we surveyed all those staff that responded and utilized the Lucas. So 34% were nurses, 32 were residents, and then attending physicians were 30, 
34% uh, of the respondents. Um, and it was overwhelmingly positive. Um, they really felt like uh, it decreased the numbers of staff in the room during cardiac arrest, which was one of the goals to limit APG uh, exposure. We had, uh, they felt that it increased the, the quality of chest compressions and as well, uh, we pulled that data from all of our defibrillators. So not only did they feel that way, but it actually did improve the quality of chest compressions. We were getting that end tidal CO2 that we wanted. We were getting the depth that we needed um, and patients were responding well to it. Um, and then they also felt like, for the most part, that it was a much more controlled resuscitation experience because the code team leader reported not having to worry about staring at you know, the clock to make sure that we were checking if we needed to switch compressors or checking the end tidal CO2 continuously, we knew that it was in place. Um, and just some of the positive, one of the big positive results was that one of the respondents said that we should have one on every floor so we can be trained in it and apply it quicker. And I couldn't agree with them more. Um, and the negatives really were the fear of the unknown. Um, a lot of people, um, staff made judgment calls that the patient didn't have the right body size without truly knowing it. Um, they were worried that maybe the suction cup had moved. Um, and so one thing that we do is we use the, the neck strap. Um, it helps keep the patient in place um, as well. Uh, one of the attendings started doing it and then we started training everyone on it. We just use a, a Sharpie to draw a line around the underside of the uh, where the suction cup is when we know that it's in place and they're getting uh, adequate end tidal CO2. We just put it down, we know it's in the right place. So if you look at the suction cup and it's not, uh, you don't see that Sharpie line, you're not in the right spot. Um, and then they were concerned about the patients getting on the backboard and getting on there uh, quick enough because we already have a backboard under place, in place. So there was some, you know, some constructive comments on the on the negative side, but it was really helpful because it helped us kind of change training. Um, so. I just wanna, I'm going really quickly for time, uh, but I wanna let you know that rapid implementation is possible. It's a huge change. People don't like change. It's not ideal to do it the way I did it, but we've done it. Staff supported it and we're reinforcing every way with training, training, training. Um, and we, they like, you know, staff like the ability to train in all of our classes in mock codes, um, and every team training we have uh, to learn the two different techniques for placing the backboard and to do it as early as possible and just get comfortable with it. So uh, I want to appreciate all of you or thank you and I appreciate all of you for spending your time with me. I'm going to push it back to Nicole uh, so she can conclude a little bit. All right. Well, thanks, Bridget. That was awesome. Um, and it, I love one of the things you guys did because you place a, you take a Sharpie marker and place an X on the chest where the cup goes or where the suction cup goes, right? Yeah, we did. Just to yeah. give it a little extra visual so we could know, yeah. even though we're going to be checking the device and checking placement. It's good to have a yeah. visual. Well, I just want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. And just to kind of wrap it up, uh, please, we're going to go five minutes over to take your questions. Um, but, you know, just some considerations for mechanical CPR. If your agency or facility is measuring manual CPR and you're doing awesome and you're doing great, then keep doing what you're doing. There's no really no need to switch. But if you're if you decide that you need to use mechanical CPR devices, I can't say enough. Training and practice and practice with with very efficient application is essential. You have to do this. And then of course, with anything, measure your team's performance, especially around application. Remind staff they have to reevaluate, just like you would reevaluate where your hands are placed. You have to reevaluate where your device is placed. Um, if you're going to use mechanical CPR, consider it early versus late. If you use it as a latch, last ditch effort, you know, I mean, it's not going to work. And and I think that's one of the the challenges. And then, of course, I think the last thing is prioritize it to areas where providing high performance CPR is going to be difficult. So the AHA, so just as a reminder, the um, American Heart Association guidelines are going to be updated in the next month to two months. So we'll see um, what their recommendations are around mechanical CPR devices. Uh, but they currently give it a 2B recommendation, uh, just again, based on the results of those randomized control trials. 
But in conclusion, high performance CPR and early defibrillation absolutely matter. Manual CPR is challenging in both the pre hospital and hospital settings. Um, you know, if mechanical CPR is used and applied efficient, efficiently, it can definitely improve CPR quality. And then it's reasonable to use it in difficult situations like the back of a moving ambulance or maybe as a bridge to PCI or ECMO. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Kathleen, who's going to give you some information on your CEs and how to obtain your CEs, but also who's going to take some questions. And like I said, we're going to go five minutes over um, so we can get some questions answered. Okay, Kathleen, I'm handing it back to you. And if you're on mute, we can't hear you. Kathleen, your GoToWebinar control panel is not muted, so it might be your headset. Can you hear me? There we go. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, Nicole and Bridget, that was an awesome session. Um, but before we begin, just want to go over a few things before we get to the Q&A. Um, the activity has been approved for one contact hour. Go to SACS testing.com forward slash SL. Um, you're going to need to register on that test site and complete the evaluation form. Um, upon successful completion, RTs and nurses will be able to print their certificate of completion. For EMS professionals, your certificate of completion will be emailed to you. And this will be archived. An archive on demand version will be available on savinglivesnow.org. So you can share this with your colleagues. An email is going to be sent to all registrants when it's available. And the on demand version will be accredited for nurses, EMS, and respiratory therapists. So I'd like the opportunity now um, to start the Q&A session and we've had some great questions asked throughout the webinar. The first one I'd like you guys to tackle is what are your collective impressions of using NIRS along with um, capnography as indicators for quality and successful resuscitation? Yeah, I'll, I can um, take this one. So I think that's a great question. So this is Nicole. Um, so NIRS, for those of you who are like, what, is, what are they talking about, is a near-infrared spectroscopy. So basically, it measures the regional oxygenation in the frontal cortex of the brain. And I will just say that it is actively being studied. The data aren't there yet, meaning, you know, we've got some observational studies, animal data, but I think stay tuned. I personally feel like there's some promise in that technology. Another great question, this was asked by Janet, what is AHA's position or recommendation about shocking through mechanical CPR? I can take this one. It's Bridget. Um, so they don't say not to. Uh, they do support uh, defibrillating uh, as appropriate with time. So you're not going to stop the mechanical CPR to do a shock. If you need to check a rhythm, you can stop, check rhythm, and then defibrillate, but you continue on. Awesome. Thank you. So another question, what weight, age, and size is recommended for use? Does it depend on the device? It yeah. Does. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Bridget. You can go ahead. No, you can take it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. So these devices aren't used in pediatric patients. Um, you know, conversely, if you've got some, I will, I will just say, more patients fit into this device than you think they do. Um, you, you, where you have to look is the width at like right around that patient's armpits. And you can have somebody who weighs, I don't know, it's like 300 pounds, but carries their weight in their belly and this thing will fit. You know, I think the only challenge I've ever seen clinically when, was when you've got somebody who has a very, very, very broad chest at the area of their armpit. Um, Bridget, is there anything else you would add to that? Yeah, no, I, I mean, the only thing I would add is just kind of what you said is you can't necessarily look at the patient and make the decision that they fit or they don't fit. Um, there's the two different devices and, and it, that's exactly it. It's the armpit width, which I don't think a lot of people look at um, and you, you don't really measure it just with your eyes. So I think you need to 
try it and put it on. And over time, you'll kind of figure it out. But there's more patients that fit in the devices than than expected. Yeah, and I'll say, like on an occasion, I've had to kind of, you know, nip and tuck a little bit. You know, <laughs> just oh, kind yeah, of push things of push but things into works. the right place. But <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. But I've been surprised at some patients who have fit into it. So uh, Janet made a comment, uh, the neck strap, stabilization strap, should be used every time. The torque of the device will cause it to move downward quickly. And she appreciated, she also believed using the marker on the chest should be mandatory. <laughs> I'm going to say I agree with both of her statements. I believe the neck strap should always be used and you should have an X just to visualize. And, you know, just like you would always reassess where your hands are placed, you need to reassess where the device is placed. I agree wholeheartedly. And actually, I the only reason I, I mentioned about the neck strap is because it is supposed to be used every time. And sometimes our staff would forget to to place it when we first rolled it out. So it's one of the things that we really emphasized in training. So the last question um, before we close it out, is there a process to the Lucas that sets the depth of compression properly? I've seen uh, too many patients where it looks like the depth of the device um, compression is too much. And that was asked by Mark. Yeah, so one th one thing to know is which device do you have? And I would say just go back to the manufacturer's um, specifications. The newer devices, you can make some adjustments. Um, so I would always just revert you back to the manufacturer's recommendations on the specific device that you have. Thank you so much, Nicole and Bridget. Um, great Q&A session. Uh, great overall learning session, and I'm going to send it back to Tracy. Thank you, and thank you everyone. We'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar, you will be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open for that, and we appreciate your feedback. A reminder that the CE Certificate of Completion in one hour following the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive an email with instructions and this link to obtain your CE credits at sachstesting.com slash SL. We'd like to thank everyone and have a great rest of your day.